turn in your Bible to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, we are in the Beholding Jesus series, uh, week 4. We're going to be talking about the returning King. Uh, I, I um, want to tell you one of the motivations for this series, the, the Beholding Jesus series. One of the motivations is this. Uh, there are, well, I was talking with someone about it yesterday. We are living in a time like no other. Um, I have been told all of my life that I'm not the center of the world. That's an important lesson for a young man. <laughs> but with modern technology and, and the way that, that things are set up and consumer driven uh, for today, you can, with the push of a button, have a package arrive on your doorstep in two days, virtually whatever you want with, within the confines of the law, whatever you want can, can arrive on your doorstep. You can, with the push of a button on your phone, have a hot meal delivered to your doorstep. That's a wonderful thing. Uh, you can, with the push of a button, uh, there's, there's so many things that, that are, are available to us. You can, with your phone right now, uh, pick up your device and find some of the best speakers in the world, men who are way better than me, right? <laughs> some of the best speakers, some of the best preaching and, and teaching in the world, uh, right, right there on demand whenever you want to. Let me tell you, I love that. But there's a little part inside of me that also kind of hates that because it puts a lot of pressure on the local pastor to bring something really good, right? <laughs> That's a good thing. We, we should raise the bar. We, we should, uh, you know, with, with uh, all the excellence and, and uh, leaning on the Holy Spirit to bring as much revelation. And, uh, but my point is this. There are several Christians in here, and I, I thank God for you. You've been alive longer than I've been a Christian. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to bring, uh, do the, the best I can to bring uh, revelation out of this word that, that you've had in your hands your whole lives. That's that's a, a little bit of, um, shall we say, uh, I felt pressure for that uh, in the past. But here's, here's my motivation, what I'm, the point I'm trying to get to in the, the Beholding Jesus series. The Lord has released me of trying to feel pressure to bring you something new and exciting that you've never heard before. There are some things that, that well, let me say this, some things you've never heard before because they weren't worth hearing. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> what we need to hear, what we need to do, what we need to behold is Jesus yes. and him crucified. Yes. He, here's, here's the, the realization that I have. I don't need to be profound. I need to show you Jesus because he is profound. Yes. I don't need to give you some great thing you've never heard. I need to show you Jesus because he is great, because he is, is revelation. He is awesome. He is glorious. Here's what Paul said to the Corinthians. It, or you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, right? He, here's what Paul said, and starting in verse 1. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. He's speaking to uh, largely a, a Greek audience here, people who loved uh, the, the uh, philosophers and the, and the great orators and speakers, and they loved wisdom. Paul says, I didn't bring you any of that. <laughs> For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in a demonstration of the spirit of and of power. Here's why. Here's why he did that. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let me show you a, a, a dream that my older sister had years ago, and, and she, she knew this was a, a dream from the Lord. How many of y'all have, have had a dream from the Lord? While you were dreaming, you knew it was God speaking to you. You don't wake up saying, was that Jesus or was that pizza? No. In the dream, you know, his sheep know his voice. In her dream, she was, she was in a long line of cars. She was in a, a caravan of cars and they were all following one truck at the lead of the, the line. When it turned left, everyone turned left. 
When it turned right, everyone turned right. And she heard the voice of God saying, if he makes a wrong turn, you're going to make a wrong turn with him. You're trusting in, in a man too much. You're trust, and, and this was the Lord convicting her. This was the Lord calling her out because she, she realized she was following her pastor instead of following Jesus. Paul said, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I'm, I'm reading a, a, a book right now from Frank Bartleman about the uh, revival in, in Azusa Street and, and the, the year leading up to it. And he, he says they were meeting in prayer services and, and one, one night, he didn't give an excuse for him, but he said one night the, the pastor was late and, and didn't show up and it was time to start. And the people looked at each other and said, the Lord's le uh, teaching us not to, tr not to rely on man, but to rely on him. Let's start with Alan. And they started praying and, and praying it down before the pastor could even get there. <laughs> I challenge you. I challenge you. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're looking at beholding Jesus. Let's, let's get to the message here today. Um, turn to Revelation chapter 1. This is when John was on, on the island of Patmos and he received from the Lord a vision of, of Jesus Christ. This is what this is what my heart hopes for, to, to meet with Jesus, to see Jesus the way that, that John saw Jesus this day. He said he was, was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. He was deep in prayer on a Sunday, and he heard a voice speaking to him. And here's what happens. We're in Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 12. He says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed in a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. And from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the shining sun in full strength. Let me stop right there. This is, is a powerful uh, revelation of, of what Jesus looks like. This, this wasn't what you quite imagined, was it? <laughs> but this is, is how Jesus chose to reveal himself to John. He revealed himself to Daniel in, in Daniel chapter 10 in much the same way, many of the same descriptions face shining like the sun, uh, body like, like, a, uh, like an emerald, like beryl, uh, B-E-R-R-Y-L, uh, uh, feet and arms like, uh, like bronze, same vision. In Matthew chapter 17 on, on the Mount of Transfiguration, when the humanity of Jesus, I heard someone say the, the veil of humanity slipped for just a moment and they saw his face shining like the sun, his clothes became like lightning, seeing the glory of God all over him. Um, I want to look at, at just a couple of these descriptions. There's, there's in Revelation 1, 2, and 3, the first three chapters, there are, I think, exactly 30 unique different descriptions of Jesus that some of them you don't really see elsewhere in the Bible. It's, it's important to study the Lord as he reveals himself to us. The way that the Lord has, has revealed himself to us, that we're not going to look at them all. But let's look at, at just these that, that we have, have looked at. First, uh, he is walking among the seven golden lampstands. These lampstands, we find out in a moment, represent what? They represent the church. Uh, they represent the seven churches that... that um, John is about to send this letter to. Jesus is the great high priest. Amen? In fact, the, when it says he's, he's wearing a long flowing robe, the word used for that is, is the same word that could have been used for, for ephod, for the priestly garments. He's wearing a long priestly garment, and he's walking among the seven golden lampstands. Do you know that one of the duties of the priests was to refill lamps when they were low on oil? refill the lamp when it is low on oil. Who is our baptizer? It's Jesus. When we are low on oil, when we are in need of what he gives, 
He is the high priest. He, he comes and refills us. Amen? Receive that. Yeah, amen. <laughs> Next, he's, he's wearing a, a golden sash across his chest. What does gold symbolize? It symbolizes wealth. It symbolizes glory. It symbolizes purity. Gold is, is refined and purified in the, in the fire, in the, in the furnace. It symbolizes, uh, it symbolizes many things. And, and this is what Jesus has, has chosen to reveal, that this is what he is clothed in. This is what he's covered in, covered in glory covered in purity. He is, he is absolutely pure. Amen. He has white hair on his head, white like wool, white like snow. Proverbs says that uh, gray hair is the glory of an old man. I'm getting more glory every day. <laughs> Think about that though. Think about that. This, this is the way that the Lord, this is the way that the Lord leads. He, he takes us from glory to glory to glory. Amen. As we grow in him, more glory. <laughs> Jesus's head is, is full of glory, full of wisdom. He is the head of the church. Amen? Amen. And he is full of wisdom and full of glory. White like snow. His eyes are burning like fire. Daniel said his eyes were like torches burning. This is the, the passion and the zeal that he has for you. When he looks at you, he looks at you with passion, not, not, um, not indifference, but he looks at you with passion. Amen. When you come near to him, when you draw near to him, that passion is, is given to you. You become passionate for him and passionate for the things that he is passionate about. His feet are like bronze. This is really cool. Uh, do you ever see uh, something bronze, some, some article, some objects, decoration usually? It's very shiny. It's very glittery. It's, it's pretty. It's beautiful. And that's what, what John is describing his feet as. Now, I, I, thought, that was, I thought that was interesting, but I, I studied a little more to see what maybe some of the symbolism in that day for bronze would be. If you were in the Mediterranean region in that time, bronze was a symbolic thing symbolizing something that has gone through judgment. Because bronze goes through a furnace, it goes through a process, it's beaten with a hammer it goes through fire and in and out of fire over and over again and until it is uh, it, it that beauty doesn't happen just on its own so when someone would look at a piece of bronze they would say hmm it's been through judgment jesus christ took the judgment of god he took the legal punishment for our sins he went through the fire for us he he went through the testing and 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 all of the the persecution that, that God could lay upon him. The fullness of God's wrath was laid upon him and his feet are now shining and, and beautiful like bronze. Amen? Amen. His voice is like the voice of many waters here, here in a little while, we're going to be at the beach and we'll hear the ocean. If you're close to the ocean and, and, and the sound of those many waters, you have to actually really talk loudly so that the people around you can hear you because the ocean is so loud and it's so constant and it's so ever present when you come near to the Lord this is what what I imagine coming near to the Lord so that his voice becomes so loud and so constant that's what John said his his voice is like many waters this is common language in the Bible to, to describe uh, as something as many waters Ezekiel said that the coming of his glory was like the sound of many waters <laughs> his voice and the sound of his coming glory sound the same, the same way. In his hand, he's holding seven stars. We find out in a moment, these are seven angels that are over the seven churches. What does the word angel mean in Greek? It means messenger. Jesus, in a moment, we'll see, puts his hand on John. Were the angels, did he drop them? I don't know. But he puts his hand on John and says, I have a message for you to send to the seven churches. He's holding messengers in his hand, puts that right hand on John and says, send this message to the churches. Out of his mouth comes a two-edged sword. We know that the, the word of God is like what? 
like a two-edged sword. Turn to, to Hebrews. Keep your, um, yeah, let's turn to Hebrews. Chapter 4, verse 12. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joint and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It cuts to soul and spirit. It divides soul and spirit divides joint and marrow the very deepest parts of a person the deepest part of their physical being the deepest part of their inner being uh, can you and i separate soul and spirit i wouldn't know how to try to do that but the word of god does that. i was i was praying for someone uh earlier this week and i i started praying for them god pierce their heart with your love not a bad thing to pray but then I changed what I was praying, and I believe it was the Lord uh, directing me. I changed what I was praying, and I started saying, Lord, pierce, your, pierce their heart with your word. And I started thinking about that. I said, why did I just say that? Pierce, your heart with your, pierce their heart with your word. And I remembered this, the word of God. The word of God pierces our hearts. The love of God, it's, that's true, it pierces our heart. But the Bible says the word of God pierces our heart. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it comes out of the mouth of Jesus. The word of God is powerful. His face is shining like the sun, uh, he also says. When Moses saw God's glory, saw God as he was passing by, he came down from the mountain and his face was shining also. And what do the people say? I don't like it. I don't like that. <laughs> you need to cover your face up. <laughs> The glory of, of God has, has an effect on us. Amen? I want to just circle back, double back, and, and look at the feet of Jesus. His feet are beautiful. Amen? Turn to Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah 52, I... I I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this might be a example of dual fulfillment. Um, that's where the Word of God will, will prophesy, will tell about um, something that is to come and also another thing that is to come. So, for example, Scripture's dealing with the, the siege of uh, Jerusalem in the Old Testament. Prophecies talking about the siege of Jerusalem would be referring to when the Babylonians besieged Jerusalem, but also referring to when the Romans laid siege to Jerusalem in 70 AD. There's, there's a, several, several examples of, of dual fulfillment. Sometimes dual fulfillment can be for the first coming of Christ, but also for the second coming of Christ. I'll, I'll show you what I mean here in just a moment. Um, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. Is everyone there? Isaiah says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy, for eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Whew. Now Paul in Romans says how beautiful are the feet of them who bring good news. He's talking about us. He, in that passage he's, he's saying, who, you know, how can someone hear unless you tell them about it? Unless you tell them about it, how can someone hear about Jesus? Because the Bible says how beautiful on the mountain are the feet of them who bring good news. But what does Isaiah say? How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Dual fulfillment. It's talking about us, according to Paul, and that's absolutely true. That's the word of God. It's also talking about when Jesus stands with his feet upon the mountain. Amen? This is, what I, this is what I want to talk about today. 
the return of Jesus Christ. Amen. One day his feet are going to stand upon Mount, uh, the Mount of Olives. And it's going to be a beautiful thing. It, it, his beautiful feet are going to be on that mountain. Mount Zion is, I'm uh, sorry, Mount of Olives is a very important mountain as it relates to Jesus Christ. He foretold his return on the Mount of Olives. He ascended from the Mount of Olives and he's coming back onto the Mount of Olives. Let's, let's look at those verses. Turn to, to Matthew chapter 24. You're going to get your Bible exercise today. I guarantee it. <laughs> Matthew 24. This is called the Olivet Discourse or Olivet Discourse, if you're French, I guess. Um, this is where Jesus is telling his disciples some of the signs of, of his return. Did you know there, there are, we argue over this number, uh, Christian theologians can't hardly agree on anything, but we argue about this number, between 150 and 170 chapters in the Bible, chapters dealing with the end times. We have a little bit of studying to do, amen? <laughs> we have a little bit of reading to do. But here's what Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 24, we're, we're going to read uh, uh, for about uh, uh, 14 verses here, starting in verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. He answered to them, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon the other that will not be thrown down. In 70 AD, when the Romans uh, took Jerusalem they burned the temple. The Bible says the temple uh, inside of the ceiling and the walls were, were, in, were overlaid with gold. As the heat of that fire burned, the gold melted and it ran down over all of the stones of the temple. And when it was cool enough to touch, I, I guess, people saw gold all over these stones and took every stone away and what Jesus said was true. Not one stone was left upon the other. They were after the gold in it. History channel for you. No. <laughs> Verse 3. Uh, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, uh, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And here's the first thing Jesus said. Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. Do not be deceived for many will come in my name saying I am the Christ and they will lead many astray and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed for this must take place but the end is not yet for kingdom I'm sorry for nation will rise against nation kingdom against kingdom and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning say the beginning the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Are we not seeing these today? Are we, does this not sound like the news? <laughs> right? You may say, we've always had war. We've always had famines. We've always had uh, earthquakes. In Luke's account, he, Luke adds on to this pestilence, pandemics. We've always had diseases. You know, you could look back at the bubonic plague hundreds of years ago. You could look further into that. Um, but Jesus said these are the beginning of birth pains. Now, it's been a few years, but I remember what those were like. Well, I was there. Um, <laughs> they started and that's when we knew and when, when we when we when she uh, had the first couple of them 
we knew that the time was coming near. And then what happened? They started coming more frequently and more severely. Jesus says, these signs will be like birth pains. Yes, you will have always had them. There's never been a time that famine hasn't existed in the world. There's never been a time that war hasn't existed in the world. But they're coming more severely and more frequently until, it's, until it becomes a constant thing. And then the end comes. And then the return of Christ comes. This is what he said to, said to look out for. We have been given so many in, in, through Scripture. This, this passage, and like I said, a, 150 passages dealing with end times. We have been given so many details in the Word of God about what the end times will look like, what's going to happen, where it's going to be happening, and there is one super important detail that is intentionally withheld from us. When? Look at verse 42 of, of this chapter. Still Jesus speaking, he says, Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. He, he, in this passage, he was talking about uh, the, the servant. If, if the servant knew what time his master was coming back, he would have behaved himself. If we were given a date, we would, we would probably say, I can goof off until then. Right? <laughs> Many would say that. Um, but we do not know when, and, and here's why we do not know when. It's in the same verse. Therefore, stay awake. Stay awake. Stay alert. Don't go to sleep. Don't, don't, uh, don't slack off. Don't, don't become complacent. Don't become prayerless. Stay awake because you do not know when he is coming. In speaking of the, the Mount of Olives, he, he ascended from the Mount of Olives. Look at Acts chapter 1. We'll just look at verse 9 here. And when he had said these things, starting in verse 9, he, when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. He ascended. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Amen. One day, not just we, but all people will see it. it uh, the Bible says it will be like lightning seen from one end of the sky to the other. When Jesus returns, the Bible says, look upon the one that you've pierced. The nations will, will see him and, and they'll cry when he returns. He's coming back from the east. He, he left from Mount Olives. It, it says in verse 4 that they, after that, they, they left Mount Olive and came back to Jerusalem. He left from Mount Olive. He's coming back to the Mount of Olives. Turn to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah 14. It's right before Malachi. Zechariah 14 verse 3 says, Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. Talking about the battle of Armageddon. And on that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mountain shall go northward the other half shall go southward and you shall flee to the valley of the mountains for the valley of the mountains shall reach to us all and you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king of Judah now hear this part then the Lord my God will come and all his holy ones with him all his holy ones with him that's you and me amen not, not holy because of anything that we have done, but holy because of everything that he has done. He makes us holy by, by his work. And we will be with him as he fights the battle. Not, not us. Never in the Bible does it say that we will be out there with 
sword and shield and fighting nations. No. We will watch as Jesus fights the battle. This is not a new practice for Christians. Amen? We worship while He fights. That's the pattern even right now. We worship while He fights. In, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, when Jehoshaphat was going out to meet the enemy, prophetically, what did he do? He sent the worshipers forward. He sent the singers and the musicians forward to worship as they went. And the Bible says that as they went forward, as they went towards the place of battle, the Lord went before them and ambushed the enemy. And the enemy went into a confusion and started slaying each other, killed each other, so that by the time the people of God got to the field of battle, there was nothing but defeated enemies before them. We worship while He does battle. Amen? Look at Revelation chapter 19. Here's, here's what that's going to look like. Revelation 19, it's, it's close to the back. It's close to the end. <laughs> Starting in verse 11, John says, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. In righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, many crowns. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe that's been dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen and white pure, that's us, following uh, him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword. A what? A sharp sword, the Word of God, with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them, that same word is shepherd, he will rule them, he will shepherd them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, is, it, it, he has a name written, King of Kings yes. and Lord of Lords. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There is no perfect leader among men. There is no perfect leader among humankind. As much as we may try to sell ourselves and, and say that we're the best leader, the, the perfect leader, you know, uh, election year, everyone's perfect, right? <laughs> never is. We could never find a perfect leader among us. When Jesus comes, even he, the nations, won't want to submit to him. Even he, the nations, won't, won't say, we're glad you're here, Jesus, come rule over us. What are they going to do? They're going to go out and fight against him. Even if you were the perfect leader, people would fight against you. Amen. And the way that he defeats them, we don't see that he ever even lifts a finger towards them. All he does is speak the word of God. When he was in the desert, Jesus says, man lives by every word of God that's spoken. When God speaks to us, He speaks life to us. But in battle, He speaks the Word of God and, and its defeat to the nations. Entire nations. A two-edged sword coming out of His mouth. From this point, uh, he, go, he, he throws the beast and the prophet of the beast into the lake of fire. Say, hell is a real place. Hell is a real place. That's why the, the death of Jesus was important. That's why the sacrifice of Jesus was important. Hell is a real place. He goes into the thousand-year reign where he is, is enthroned on the earth uh, with us for a thousand years, and the devil would be chained up at that point so that he cannot deceive nations for a thousand years. In the sovereignty of God, he, he turns him loose one more time, and the devil stirs up the nations for one last kind of pitiful-looking effort to come against God and his people. They surround the city, the city of Jerusalem, and the Bible says fire comes out of heaven this time and consumes them all. And the, the devil is thrown into the lake of fire forever, forever. From this point, the, the great white throne judgment takes place where God opens up, where, sorry, excuse me, Jesus opens up, it, the Bible says he opens up books and the book of life. 
He opens up books first, and then he opens up the book of life. What are the books? The Word of God. By the Word of God, he defeats nations, and by the Word of God, he judges nations. And then he looks into the book of life to see if your name is, is written in the book of life. I cannot tell you how much power is in this Word of God, yeah, yeah. that it can defeat nations, yeah. that it can judge the world. I cannot tell you how, how powerful this is. From there, we, we go into the New Jerusalem and we worship Jesus forever. I, I said his face is shining. It lights the entire city. We'll have no need for, for electricity or uh, lamps or anything because his face will be lighting the entire city and we'll worship him forever. I said forever. Amen. How long is forever? Is that a song? How long is forever? Think about a million years. If you were to count to a million, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, by seconds, it would take you 12 whole days. If you were to count by seconds to a billion, it would take you, guess, 31 years. If you were to count to a trillion by seconds, I had to write this number down because I wouldn't remember it. 31,688 years to count to a trillion by seconds. But we're not going to live for a million years or a billion or even a trillion. We're going to live forever with him. And that's exciting news. <laughs> and this is why the saints in, in the New Testament would encourage each other and greet each other with the term Maranatha. Come quickly, Lord. Come back, King of, of Israel. Come back, Jesus. Come quickly, Lord. That was even before the revelation that John had. Uh, Paul greeted uh, or ended his letter to the Corinthians with Maranatha. Come, O Lord. Before even they saw what John saw, they were saying, Come back, Lord Jesus. Zechariah says, Rejoice, O Israel. Rejoice, O Zion, for your king is coming. For us, we're, we're rejoicing. What should, it, uh, what should it do to us to know that Jesus is coming back? Revelation says, at, at the end of Revelation, He is coming back soon. He is coming back quickly. It ought to stir us up, not just with rejoicing, but with a urgency for those who are around us. Knowing, we don't know how long forever is, but we can, we can get a, a glimpse of an idea of how long forever is. Looking at those around us, wanting them to partake in goodness forever, partake in Jesus forever. Amen. Stir yourselves up towards, towards prayer and towards the, the spreading of gospel. Let's, let's pray this morning. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the returning King, that you are coming back for a bride that is pure and spotless. We thank you, Jesus. We are looking forward to the day when you return. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for stirring up our hearts so that we can bring people around us with us, O oh God. We don't partake in, in salvation alone. We don't partake in your goodness by ourselves, but we want those around us to look to you and, and to serve you and to partake in your goodness forever with you, Jesus. You said that you were going to your father's house to prepare a place for us that we could be with you where you are. We want to be with you, Jesus. Our hearts cry out today, come quickly, Lord. We love you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah, God. Mm. When you left the earth, you said to your disciples, go and spread this message. Go and make disciples. I will give you power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and to the ends of the earth. This is the point that we're at right now. Thank you for giving your Holy Spirit to us so that we can share the good news of your gospel to the edge of the earth where we are, Jesus. We love you, God. We praise you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.